So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our two moderators for tonight's conversation, Super Connected World, Myth or Marvel? So firstly, I'd like to introduce to the stage the wonderful and creative Narelle Hooper, editor of Boss Magazine. Narelle Hooper. And a gentleman who's been described as one of this century's most insightful corporate philosophers by Forbes magazine. He is founder and executive chairman of the Hames Group, president of the Asian Foresight Institute and a partner in the Constellation. Richard Hames works internationally as an advisor to governments and with many of the world's most innovative and entrepreneurial business corporations. Richard is also personal mentor to heads of state, government, ministers and company directors across Asia, Africa, the Middle East, Europe and South America. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Hames. We've got a very eminent group of people here as speakers and the audience. I've been looking at the list on the way through tonight. So I think we're going to have a really fantastic deep conversation and look forward to your contribution. So as Tanya said, welcome to Super Connected World, Mar Marvel or Myth? And Richard and I are going to be moderating uh, this evening. Uh, a little reminder up front, our conversation is going to be recorded by Radio National and that's going to be turned into the Creative Innovation podcast along with all the other sessions. And we would also like your feedback if you're not going to be here for the rest of the, conf uh, the conference. So there's some forms, so fill those in and pop them in at the front on, uh, as you leave tonight. We're going to have a session, a, a good discussion now and then we'll take a break for a light supper and come back um, just before 8 o'clock tonight to continue the, the conversation. Now, with us this evening to discuss the super connected world, myth or marvel, and uh, hopefully to help us with some strategies and, and something quite practical to take away, are our three eminent guests. And we're going to have... Um, this is also helping me... To, I'm, I'm thinking we might actually possibly have an answer to what happens when you get an inventor with an interest in pattern recognition a philosopher and, and cognitive scientist and, a, uh, and very irrever irreverent at that and a technology entrepreneur with a fascination for the brain-computer interface in the one room together. And Richard, I'm hoping that also we'll get an answer to my question, which is how come things feel like they're moving so damn fast? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get an answer to that. <laughs> I hope so. So first up, uh, would, would you, uh, I'd like to welcome Ray Kurzweil, Kurzweil who's... Um, Featured in our Boss magazine, this issue, which came out the other day, as I scruffle around here to find it. So um, we'll have some copy of those for you, and there's a really interesting background to Ray's story. Uh, Ray's been enthralling us and um, educating us and, and surprising us for, for 30 to 40 years uh, about how humans and the artificial computer world and digital world will interact. He's the co-founder of the Singularity University and author of several books, my favourite of which was The Age of the Spiritual Machine some years ago, and more recently The Singularity is Near. Uh, he's a musician, he's, well, I would say probably a polymath, he's so, so uh, talented. Please put your hands together and welcome Ray Kurzweil. Thanks. Thanks. Come on down, Ray, have a seat. Oh. Great. Ray's going to take a seat and I'm going to introduce our second speaker. And Daniel is... Just excuse me while I get myself organised here. E uh, incredibly well published. Daniel Dennett is the author of Darwin's Dangerous Ideas. That's from 1995. He's the University Professor and Austin B. Fletcher Professor of Philosophy and the co-director of the Centre for Cognitive Studies at Tufts University. He received his BA in Philosophy from Harvard and then went on to Oxford to work with Gilbert Ryle and under his supervision he completed his Doctor of Philosophy and that was back in 1965. Uh, so there's much I could, more I could tell you but I think a journey through... Dan's books. His first book, Content and Consciousness, appeared in 1969, then Brainstorms from 1978, Elbow Room and The Intentional Stance, Consciousness Explained in 1991, and then followed da Darwin's Dangerous Idea and Kinds of Minds. Now, he's among his interests, he's helped design museum exhibits on computers for the Smithsonian and the Museum of Science in Boston, and Daniel's also a sculptor. Please welcome Daniel Dennett. Thank you very much. 
And uh, third, this is what happens when you get a technology entrepreneur with an interest in um, the human brain interface, and that's Tan Lee. Tan, I had the pleasure of seeing at uh, the advanced conference earlier in the year. And she's one of uh, Australia's young Australians of the year in 1998. She's the founder and chief executive of Emotive Life Sciences, a bioinformatics company. And it's focused on identifying biomarkers in the brain for mental and other neurological conditions. I'm sure she's going to tell us more about that tonight. And she was voted Australia's, one of Australia's 30 most successful women under 30, the same year she won the Young Australian of the Year Award. And she's won another, a, a, a string of recognitions, including Fast Company's Most Influential Women in Technology, Forbes' Names You Need to Know, that's this year, so you know her now. And she was the World Economic Forum, a, a young global leader in 2009. Please welcome Tan Lee. Thank you all, and over to you, Richard. Well, I, I was immensely excited uh, being able to come here. I live in Bangkok, as a lot of you know, and uh, uh, Melbourne is my hometown. And to actually get the, all these people on the same platform, I mean, the brain power assembled here and in this room tonight, what a marvellous opportunity to really explore deeply some of the things that are affecting us now. So uh, where I want to start off with is, um, is, is just actually grounding everything in in what we see happening around us. At the, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, around the world there's a gradual awakening, or I don't know whether, Dan, you'd call it consciousness, but there's a gradual awakening in civic society to something in terms of, well, we're not as free as we thought we were, there are things working in the system that are working against us, we want more of what we haven't got, and at the same time we're seeing elected uh, representatives and, and leaders in corporations a lot of the time knowing that there's an imperative to act but not knowing what to do. And so one the, the first question I'd like to pose all of us is what is going on and is it, um, is it a new consciousness uh, arising within society? And, and if so, what are the implications of that and what could the consequences be? Let's start with Ray. Uh, to start... Uh, with the idea of the super-connected world and to address your question uh, and to actually start in the past, I wrote in the early 80s in my first book, The Age of Intelligent Machines, that the Soviet Union would be swept away by the then-emerging social network. I didn't call it that, but decentralized electronic communication, which at that time was early forms of email over teletype machines and fax machines. And, People thought that was pretty nuts. The Soviet Union was a mighty superpower. It's going to get swept away by a few teletype machines. Uh, that's exactly what happened in that coup against Gorbachev in 91. And then with the rise of the web in the late 90s, we saw a wave of democratization, and we're seeing it now with social networks. And, it's, and that's just one example, the political level. Uh, a, a woman walks into a doctor with a chronic disease. She's part of a community of people that have that condition who are passionate about doing something about it. Uh, in fact, there's collaborative decision-making being done by patient groups and all kinds of groups uh, through the power of being connected together. Uh, there's many examples of, of sort of liberation from this connected world. Uh, MIT, where I went and I'm on the board, puts out all of its courseware online for free, and there are like a thousand schools in Africa where kids gather around a computer and take MIT courses for free. And that's just one small example of the tremendous amount of knowledge that's available. A kid in Africa with a smartphone has access to more information and knowledge than the President of the United States or Australia did 15 years ago. I, I used that line a couple of weeks ago and noticed that Chelsea Clinton was in the front <laughs> row. I said, that was your father, actually. Um, but he did a good job anyway, and I'm sure he's got a smartphone now. Uh, <laughs> And speaking of which, people say, oh, well, only the wealthy are going to have these kinds of tools you talk about in the future. And I say, yeah, like cell phones today. Uh, Fifteen years ago, you had to be wealthy to have a mobile phone, and you didn't take it out of your pocket. It was quite big and bulky and didn't do very much. Uh, today, there are five or six billion of them. Thirty percent of Africans have them. Half the farmers of China and their gateways to knowledge. Uh, and they're quite liberating. The tools of creative change, of disrupting the world, of innovation, 
is in everybody's hands. So a kid at Harvard who wanted a better way to date girls, that was the original motivation, created Facebook with $19,000 of capital. A couple of kids at Stanford in the late night dorm room challenge created Google on their $1,000 laptops. And, what's, and I'll just say a word of what's underlying this phenomenon, which is the exponential growth of information technology. I call it the law of accelerating returns. And it's not just Moore's law, it's a much broader phenomenon. But if you look at computers, when I went to MIT, I used a computer. Well, I went there because it was so advanced that MIT actually had a computer. And uh, this is a million times cheaper. It's several thousand times more powerful. That's a several billion-fold increase in computers per unit per dollar. And the same thing is true of communications. Same thing is true of all information technologies. Want to buy a million bytes of genetic sequencing? That, that costs half as much as last year, one thousandth as much as 10 years ago. This is worth a, this is worth a trillion dollars in terms of communication and computation circa 1975, because uh, it wouldn't fit in my pocket if I were to buy it. I'm not sure the world actually had that much computation and communication back then. Uh, for various reasons, that's going to continue. And that's going to enable very profound changes. And, and in my view, this, you know, we are going to merge with these machines, and then people say, oh, we're going to lose our humanity. Uh, in my mind, we're going to transcend our biology, when it transcend the limitations of our biology. But this is part of being human, using these kinds of tools. We're the only species that does that.